Hello, uh, I'm Dennis Delaney, Extension Specialist for Soybeans and Conservation Cropping Systems uh, with Extension System at Auburn University. And I'm going to talk a little today about uh, when to co terminate cover crops to maximize soil moisture and re soil residue levels at planting time. And why use cover crops? Of course, everybody can remember back in the, in the Dust Bowl days or the history of it. Uh, where uh, we didn't use any cover crops, had a lot of wind and soil erosion. So erosion control, soil water quality improvement, if we get enough organic matter back into the soil, increased water infiltration, uh, minimized nutrient losses through this erosion, uh, all this expensive fertilizer we put out there, we wanted to stay in place. And if we use legumes as a cover crop, uh, we can get some extra nitrogen from them. But it's always a balancing act. Um, cover crop management uh, and cost in time and, in, and money versus cover crop benefits. Again, the, the objective is not necessarily uh, maximizing the cover crop, but maximizing the benefits from, from the cash crop that's going to follow it. We just need to get the best uh, balance of that. Uh, it's always nice to have a real deep cover crop with a lot of biomass out there if you're going to go through all this expense. Of, of planting, it's good to uh, to get as much back out as we can. We spend a lot of money for soil fertility, adjusting the pH, the seeding cost, uh, inoculation on legumes, uh, again planting cost, machinery, and so on. Uh, but again, we want to terminate that as late as possible uh, to get the maximum dollar benefits back out of the cover crop after we spend all this money to get it established. I uh, want to remember that, that surface soil effects are the most critical. Uh, those are the ones that really cushion the soil surface, uh, help capture the rainfall. Uh, That's what we're planting the seed into. We want optimal moisture and organic matter there. Uh, so if, the more we can leave those cover crops on top of the surface, the better off we are. There's a lot of influences that might, uh, on when we might want to terminate the cover crop. Uh, in the, the soil temperature, uh, and again, going back to the cash crop that we want to plant, what the top of the soil temperature might be, the soil moisture status. Uh, it's important to remember these cover crops are living plants. Uh, a lot of them are deep rooted, uh, particularly the grasses, and they can pull a lot of soil moisture uh, out that uh, won't be available to the cash crop that we want to plant into them. Uh, weed suppression, there's some, some of the cover crops have allelopathic compounds. Uh, we want to manage those as much as we can. If we have a cash crop that's sensitive to these allelopathic compounds, you might have to allow uh, at least two or three weeks uh, before planting in order for those to dissipate out. And sometimes if we're using a legume, we want to synchronize the uh, nitrogen release from the residues according to when the crop needs it. If crops are needed early, we may need to terminate the cover crop early. If it doesn't need it till late, we may be able to let the cover crop grow a little bit longer. And also the pest potential. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't leave a, a green bridge out there between the, the cover crop uh, being green and then the new green seedlings coming up for things like cutworms and diseases and all kinds of other pathogens to just jump from one uh, from the cover crop into our cash crop and, and, and destroy it. So we want to make sure we cut that green bridge at some point and, uh, and have dry residue uh, before we plant. Um, we have to kind of manage these constraints too. Normally one big advantage of the cover crop is that it keeps soil temperatures cooler in the summertime, but it also can keep it cooler in the spring. We don't necessarily want that. Uh, you just have to be patient understand that it's going to keep soil temperatures a little cooler but an example of cotton is waiting until it's at least 65 degrees fahrenheit for several days at, at eight o'clock in the morning in your low temperatures uh, with continued warm temperatures uh, forecast so again it just pays to be patient and just know that it's going to be a little bit cooler under these cover crops uh, another thing i already mentioned is, is these cover crops are uh, green and growing uh, we've seen soil moisture depletion down to two or three feet under a good wheat cover crop. Uh, so 
is a quote here, the time of termination is more critical as the probability expected precipitation decreases. If no rain is in the forecast for the next week or two, uh, it, and we haven't had rain recently, it may be a good idea to go ahead and, and terminate that cover crop maybe a little bit earlier. And the chances are while the cover crop is dying or melting down, that in the next two or three weeks that we probably will get a rainfall to replace at least some of that cover crop so moisture usage. Uh, and if it doesn't rain, then we probably wouldn't want to plant the uh, cash crop anyway. But again, normally here in the southeast, we should get a rain within two or three weeks that help replenish some of that uh, soil moisture. Uh, I want to mention here that uh, as far as timing and terminating the cover crop, uh, there's several bar graphs here. This is some of the USDA data from, from Kip Balcom. But you can see that uh, rye and wheat, the amount of biomass we can get uh, before corn planting versus the amount of biomass we can get before cotton planting uh, is, is simply a matter of we can wait usually a month or so longer to terminate that cover crop before cotton than we can before corn. Uh, normally, I like to see at least 4,000 pounds of biomass out there to consider to be a, a good cover crop. Uh, there will really be a lot of benefit to, to conserve soil moisture uh, later in the season. And you can see before corn, a lot of times it's really difficult to get that, particularly with wheat. Uh, it's, it's hard to get the maximum benefit back out. Whereas with cotton, you got another month or so where you can let the cover crop grow in the spring and, and really maximize those benefits. I also mentioned the uh, maximizing the nitrogen benefits, uh, synchronizing the nitrogen release compared to when the crop needs it, uh, and to know that uh, the difference between some of the crops that may immobilize nitrogen, like most of the grass cover crops, rye and wheat and so on, will tie it up, and the legumes that uh, will tend to release it a lot easier. So if you have a crop that needs nitrogen early, Again, the legumes will release it fairly quickly. Uh, if you have a crop that needs a lot of nitrogen early, the grass cover crops may need to kill them a, a little earlier than you ordinarily want to, just to start that, that mobilization process of the nitrogen. As far as the optimum kill time uh, for the cover crop, it's uh, just like the cash crops, it's important to use growth stages to go by instead of just calendar date. Uh, most of the time we want to kill these cover crops uh, at about the bloom stage. That's usually, as a general rule, the maximum biomass that we can get out of them. Uh, so, for example, with grass cover crops, we want to wait till they're uh, on up into the boot stage, maybe even beginning to head, uh, to get that, that maximum biomass. Anything beyond that, we're just getting the stiffening, the stem, the seed field, and so on, but we're really not getting much biomass beyond that stage. But if you, you kill too early by the calendar date, you may not get that, that maximum biomass out of your, your cover crop. Uh, again, for most annual cover crops, full bloom is a maximum biomass. If you want maximum residue longevity, uh, the mid seed fill, usually with these cover crops, particularly the grasses, you end up with a stiffer stem and a lot slower decay, so it lasts out there a lot longer. But as always, the, the you have to take into account the planting need dates of the cash crop. Uh, you don't want to delay too long and, and hurt the cash crop uh, yields. Uh, it, that's the, the whole idea of, of the system, the cover crop and the cash crop system. Um, what we find out over the years, uh, working a lot with the, the USDA unit here in campus and others across the southeast, but we found that soil carbon and crop residues are the real key to making conservation tillage work. It's not just the lack of tillage, but producing and conserving this, the cover crop residues that, that offers the most benefit to productivity. Uh, particularly here in the southeast where there are higher soil temperatures and, and rainfall, uh, organic matter breaks down pretty quickly. So if we just uh, go back into crop residues or, or have a minimal cover crop and kill it too early, uh, we're just not going to build up uh, soil organic matter and, and build up soil productivity. We need to go ahead and maximize that, that cover crop out there to, to have the most benefits. 
Uh, you can see in, in the bottom slide, uh, this has been pretty typical. A lot of producers, particularly 10 or 15 years ago, uh, they want to go ahead and make sure they got the cover crop killed, soil temperature warmed up. But uh, in, in about a month or two, uh, that leafy material is just going to break down almost completely and you won't be able to see any of it left at all. It's not going to do any shading the soil surface as compared to in the upper left with a good heavy rye cover crop stemming. It's going to be there a while, all the way through the fall. So we can kind of maximize the benefits of it uh, rather than just throw money down the hole. But as always, uh, I mentioned in the beginning, it's always a balance in the act of the cover crop management, uh, particularly as it affects the cash crop versus uh, the cover crop benefits. Thank you.